Hi there! I'm uh, back on my bed for now, just because this is going to be a pretty long video and I don't feel like standing for the whole thing, so, uh, Wattpad! This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, by this point, I think we all know more or less what Wattpad is. It's just a website out there where writers can put their stuff out. You know, sometimes it's fan fiction, sometimes it's original fiction, and sometimes it's actually okay, sometimes it's awful. And today I kind of just wanted to look at some of the more bad examples of stories out there that we can just, you know, have, have a laugh at. But before I get started on that, I do want to uh, put something out there. So I asked people about this a while ago on, you know, if they, if they wanted me to talk about some of these hilariously awful stories. And they, there were a couple of people that had reservations about it. They said, you know, Wattpad is more, it, it's where teenage writers go to hang out. You know, it's where young people hang out and they're just having fun. And so it could come across as bullying if I was making fun of their work like this. And I thought long and hard about that because I don't want to come across that way. I don't. I, I think we should all be able to just, you know, come out, have fun, poke fun at this. And, you know, the people that write it should also be able to have a laugh at themselves. And so, to dispel the notion that I'm here to bully people, I figured the best way was to just throw myself out there, too. So, down in the description, you'll see a link to my old Fiction Press account, which, it, it's awful, okay? There's a couple of stories on there. Not, not everything I wrote is on there, because there have been things I've deleted over the years, and I haven't touched anything on there in years, but there's just shit I wrote when I was, like, 15, 16, and it's, it's the worst. Please, please don't check it out. <laughs> please. Uh, and if, if you do, feel free to make fun of me in a video too, because, you know, a as much as you cringe at it, it's 100% edge, trust me, but as much as you cringe at it, I cringe far more, and there's nothing you can say that I haven't already said to myself. And so with that out of the way, let's, uh, let's look at some awful Wattpad stories. So this first one is called Fuckboy by H2Ho. Uh, the summary says, Fuckboy, also known as a teenage boy who will use and hurt as many girls as possible, as long as they're getting lucky. Prologue. You know those guys in your school? Not the normal ones, but the fuckboys? Yeah, those ones. If you don't know those guys, then you may just not know the meaning of the term fuckboy. Okay, real quick, I'm not that old, I'm only 22. Is fuckboy a thing that kids say these days? Because I, really ha I really don't hear that term used by people my age. Generally, a fuckboy is actually an attractive, funny guy. Usually, you wouldn't want to admit it, but everyone knows it, even himself. A fuckboy has an unhealthy amount of confidence in himself, which helps him to lead girls on just for hookups. Okay, but see, you just, call you just said that fuckboys would be attractive and funny, and now you're saying they have too much confidence. He'll say that he's really into you, but doesn't want to deal with an actual relationship. He thinks about himself and only himself all the time, but is nice to most people. That's another oxymoron. Did someone come to mind? Because I know one did for me. There's this one fuckboy at my school, Connor Owens. And he's probably the hottest guy in my grade. At least that's what all the girls think. He's tall, has brown hair, tanned skin, and the most mesmerizing bluish-green eyes. He's a really fun person to be around, and he's a pretty smart guy. We're in all the AP classes together. It may sound like I'm attracted to the, him, but then again, who wouldn't be? I mean, yeah, based on the way you're describing him, I'm kind of attracted to him. I don't even like dudes. The only turnoff for me is that he's a fuckboy. <laughs> there's something about that word. <laughs> I, I don't know, it just sounds weird. In all honesty, he's fucked every girl in our grade, except for maybe four of us. Granted, our, our school is small, and our graduating class is only made up of 48 students in total. Or, sorry. Granted, our school is small, and our graduating class in only made up of 48 students in total. So, wait, if we assume that half of those are girls, that means the students had sex with 20? That's... In, in just this school. That's, wow. That's a lot. Everyone at that school has gonorrhea now. We're going into our senior year, and all I know is that he's tried getting me to sleep with him quite a few times last year, but I haven't given him the satisfaction of my hot bod. Ha, just kidding. But seriously, that is my life goal right now, to make it through high school without giving him the pleasure of sleeping with yours truly. Okay, 
I was a little confused there, because I was thinking, wait, is she saying she doesn't have a hot bod, or is she saying that he did, in fact, get the pleasure, the satisfaction of her hot bod? I don't, I don't know. So that's the prologue. Here's chapter one. My name's Elizabeth Morgan. I'm 17 and a senior at Hillside High. If you didn't catch on, I live in this town called Hillside. We have lots of hills, and it's the most boring place I've ever lived. I don't recommend it to anyone. Anyways, back to the important stuff, and the real reason why you're reading this. At my school, there's this one boy who is commonly known as the fuckboy. I can't. I can't do it any more of this. I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah, I finished the prologue, and I finished about two paragraphs of the first chapter before I had to give up. And so that one, um, the main issue I had with it was, one, it was super fucking repetitive, and two, they just kept using the word fuckboy. <laughs> Which, I don't know what it is, okay? I've heard people use that occasionally in the past, but every time I think of it, I just think of, like, a male sex slave or something. It's... <laughs> just, uh, I can't. I can't. It's a funny word, okay? Fuckboy is a funny word. But, um, so in the interest of fairness, I also want to say something positive about it, and I will say that, uh, the prose is actually fairly competent, you know, like, it's, it, I could understand what you're saying when you write it, like, it's not amazing, but I could make out what's going on, which is better than a lot of amateur writers do when they start off. And also, that's kind of how kids think, that's kind of how teenagers think, you know, they're, they're assholes and they're very judgmental to everybody, and, well, yeah, that's about all I have to say on that one. This next one is called Taking the Bad Boy's Virginity by Sammy underscore am underscore I. Summary. I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Natalia, and I'm 20. I'm still in high school, and I have the sex drive of a rabbit. <laughs> I tend to be very carefree, and sometimes that gets me in tough situations, like when I took the bad boy's virginity. <laughs> now he's forcing me to date him for it. Without any sex, this is going to be tough. I'm already really confused, um, being 20 in high school is, like, bad, but, you know, okay, shit happens. Um, you, you took the, quote, bad boy's virginity, the bad boy, as, like, implying that there's only one, whatever, um, and now he's forcing you to date him for it without having sex again, okay. I guess that's a read and find out sort of situation, so here we go, chapter one. My motorcycle vibrates under me as I ride to school, heat spreading to my lower region. Holy shit, one sentence. It, it took one sentence for me... Wow. Um, well, I can't give up already. Let's keep going. Damn, just what I need in time for school. I push any sex-related thoughts from my head, and I focus on the following day. Calculus, AP Psych, English, then party prep for tonight. Always fun, and I always get laid, too. God, I'm not making this up. This is really what it says. I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Natalia, and I'm 20. Although I do all right in school, as a freshman and sophomore, I missed so many days that I've had to redo these two years. But that's all right with me. Before you find out the hard way, I'll tell you now. I'm horny. All of the time. My life is filled with sex, and has been since I was a kid. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, no. No, no. No. No, none of that. My parents even took me to the doctors for my constant arousal, but the only solution they could come up with was to buy me sex toys so I could satisfy myself. Aside from that little hobby, I like to model and paint, although I do not do either religiously. I come from a wealthy family, and although we were happy together once, my mom passed away and now I live alone in a big house in my hometown while my dad travels with his large business, paying my bills and sending me large checks for monthly allowances. I pull into a parking lot in front of the building and turn off the bike. Although the vibrating stopped, the heat in between my legs didn't disappear. I made a mental note to take care of this before the party tonight as I absentmindedly unlocked my locker. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, okay, I get it, sometimes you're horny in inappropriate situations, but like... Do they need to focus on it this much? Natalia? How long will it take for you to notice me? To my left is my tall, handsome, best friend with benefits, Salvatore. He's built large with broad shoulders and a muscular body, sandy blonde hair, and brown eyes. I squeal and wrap my arms around his neck, conscious of how my body presses into his. To my dismay, his hands go to my hair, rather than on my waist, where I'd prefer them, so I pull away. That was a long sentence. Are you ready for the party tonight? Hell yeah! 
You are parties are always lit, Nat. He smiles, pulling his hand through my long, blonde hair. It's one of the many genes I was blessed with. To most boys, I'm a jackpot. I'm thin, have curves, 34D, big butt, and of course, blue eyes, which could either melt chocolate or burn a hole through the wall, depending on my intent. <laughs> Who the fuck wrote this? Seriously, like, this feels like it was written by a guy, but I don't think it was. I, of course, use my looks to my advantage. Today, I am wearing high-waisted booty shorts with a crop top, which is the basis of my everyday summer school attire. In this school, I have a bit of a reputation, too. I was labeled a bad girl for my crazy parties, bad school habits, and, of course, my love of sex, which almost every guy in this school knows, and half of which have actually experienced. Okay, this is another school where everyone there has gonorrhea. Although I'm labeled this, I know I'm not actually a bad girl. The real bad award goes to Lucas, the bad boy of every good girl's dreams. He doesn't come to school. Smokes, does drugs, graffiti, fights, you name it. Despite all that, he still is the most attractive boy in school. Tall and muscular, with dark brown hair and green eyes. Every teenage heartthrob. Okay, so is it just me, or do Lucas and Salvatore sound very similar? Like, they sound like they look the same. The author's got a type. It's time for class. You ready? You've been standing on in the same spot for over a minute, Salvatore says, pulling me away from my locker. Oh, of course. We walk together to my first class of the day, and I can't wait for it to be over. Thirty minutes until the party. My blonde hair is down, makeup done, and I'm in a tight, purple, long-sleeved dress covered with skulls and no shoes. I lay on the couch, my legs spread what oh, no. Okay, yeah, she's just masturbating now, so, uh, we're not, we're not reading that part. Um, <clears throat> so, taking the bad boy's virginity. Uh, I made it like a third of the way through the first chapter before I had to give up, and that one wasn't because it was just so awful. Uh, it was more just because it was super sexual, and I don't feel like reading that on camera. I guess the overall concept of that one sounds okay, um... I, I don't know, plus the concept is not really the end-all be-all of a story, it's more based on the execution of it. And, uh, I guess that one was written okay, even if it was immediately raunchy and had a couple of points where I was like, whoa, what the fuck, like, how sex has been part of her life since she was a kid, like... Th think through the things you write before you put them out there, guys, just, just do that. Um, but... I guess it is kind of neat to see sex being portrayed as not being in a negative light, uh, especially in a book which, one, is aimed at young people, and two, features young people as the protagonists, because I, I think as a society we've mostly been moving away from that more puritanical mindset, but you do still see it pop up a lot, and so it, it's, it's kind of neat to see it be like, yeah, the main character is horny all the time and has a lot of sex, but that doesn't make her like a bad person. At least I think that's what it was going for. Again, I barely read any of it. This next one is called Two Gangs and a Golden Girl. Summary. The West and East gangs of Tigerwell have been at each other's throats since the dawn of time, and the two leaders of these gangs want to end the fight, once and for all. But fighting with fists is easy. Fighting with wit and charm is a whole other ball game. Blake, West Side gang leader. Leather jacket and killer glare. Don't talk back. Owen, East Side gang leader, fancy coat and toxic stare. Don't resist. And in comes Amber, hair of gold and oceans in her eyes, has paint on everything she wears and always, always manages to get into the middle of trouble. Quote, she's a golden storm, end quote. But these bad boys have no idea who they're really dealing with. Amber is determined to break all the cliches. Three can play this game. Okay, so I honestly have no idea what this is supposed to be about after that. Uh, I'm assuming some sort of Romeo and Juliet-esque sort of thing. I, I don't know, but... Like, yeah, I, okay, whatever, let's go. Okay, so skipping over the introductory parts where they're like, hey, this character should be played by this person, and here's a trailer for the book, because books have trailers now. I don't know, when did that become a thing? I, I don't remember ever really seeing that for a very long time, and then all of a sudden it started popping up a couple of years ago? I, I don't know. I, I have living under a rock syndrome, so maybe that's just me. Anyways, chapter one. Amber, I need your help, I hear Uncle Anton shout from upstairs. 
I'm in the basement, covered in shades of yellow, and nowhere near done with my artwork. So right off the bat, if you want to make a girl quirky and relatable, you make her an artist, okay? She's All That taught us that lesson about 20 years ago, and it has aged remarkably well. Okay, that, that sounded weird. I'm not going to do another take, though. I'm busy, I shout back and blow a rebellious golden hair that fell from my messy bun out of my face. This is literally a matter of life and death, my uncle mules. I hear a clatter and a God damn it!" from upstairs before I decide to help the poor man. I quickly stir my paintbrush in the jar of water before chucking it into my shoulder bag, grabbing my sketchbook and paints, and rushing upstairs. When I get to the kitchen, I spot Uncle Anton peering at the toaster. This bloody bread tanner isn't working, he complains. Oh, is he supposed to be English? I... This bloody bread... No, I'm not, I'm not doing that, no. I let out a sigh and push the lever down at the side. That's genius, Amber, genius, Uncle Anton says. His face is too sincere for me to tell him how ungenius it really is. You'd never guess he's a doctor. A bloody doctor! I check the time and swear under my breath. I'm going to be late, I mutter. Late for what? Uncle Anton asks. School! Okay, so there's just a bit of dialogue there, and then her cousin Jessie shows up and starts eating breakfast. Jessie sees my change in mood and catches my eye. You sure you're ready, she asks. My psychiatrist says I'm ready. She says I'm dealing amazingly with the fact that I lost my parents in a robbery. It's my last year of high school, and if my psychiatrist says I'm ready for the first semester, who am I to oppose? Okay, there's clumsy exposition. There's terrible exposition. And then there's that shit. Jessie and I climb into her silver Ford and make our way to school. So, first day at Tigerwell High. You nervous? Jessie asks. Not really, I answer. My previous school wasn't something memorable. It was pretty average, and I was pretty average. And my friends were pretty average and, well, boring, I guess. I wasn't one to inform the whole school my parents were rich. Well, that... Some about that made it hard to read. I wish you'd let us drive your BMW. Everyone would be so jealous of us. I don't answer that. The BMW is the last thing my parents bought me. The car, along with the millions my parents left me, will most likely not be used soon. I only made sure to pay in some money into my aunt and uncle's bank account. I don't want to be a burden to people I love. My parents were rich. I'm not even going to try to deny it. But to me, they were average. And average isn't always bad. Sure, we lived in a mansion and had plenty of sports cars, but those things never mattered to me. What mattered was that they always made a smiley on my eggs and toast, and that they were always there when I needed someone to talk to, and just when they... Oh, wow. Um, you know what? I got a little too into mocking her there, and I kind of lost track of what I was saying, but, uh, you know what? Amber, fuck you, rich kid. Okay, that's my message to you. Fuck you. Amber, you're doing it again, Jessie interrupts. I look back at her. Doing what? You went blank. I was telling you about the clicks at Tigerwell High. Oh. And as quickly as the dark thoughts came, I banished them. I put on my brightest smile and will my eyes to sparkle. Can, can you do that? Can, can, can you... Just, okay. We finally get out of the Ford and make our way to school. My new kind of prison for the next few months. The kind where I'll have to smile until my face hurts and hide the paint spots on my clothes. Because remember, she's a very relatable artist, despite the fact that she's rich and gorgeous. We enter the hallway, and it's just as I remembered high school to be. Kids are laughing and catching up all around. A few couples are making out against lockers. Mean girls are gossiping. Jocks are fletching, flexing. Nerds are reading. Pervs are perving, and... Wait, you can't just gloss over that, okay? Pervs are perving. What the fuck does that mean? Okay, if the, if the, just... I, I'm, I don't even know what that could possibly mean. Hit me up with some comments if you think you know what that means. Don't actually do that. And what the hell are they? I spot a couple of guys at the end of the hallway walking like they're Greek gods. Not towards Jesse and me, but if we don't move within the next minute, we'll probably become roadkill. Kids are practically diving to get out of the way of the five guys, some going as far as to bow their heads or straight up run for their lives. The five guys all seem to be mainly dressed in black. And they're all hot. But it's the guy in the middle that catches my eye, with his raven black hair and eyes that I know all the way from here are silver gray. He walks with a bit more confidence. There's a permanent sneer carved into his stone-cold face. Jessie grabs my arm. We got to move, she says and turns me. When she has me turned around, we're facing guys from the other side of the hallway. 
they walk with the exact same level of authority and superiority, but where the other guys have people running away, these guys have people melting. The girls are all basically drooling and guys are getting envious, and where the first group of jeans are modeling ripped jean or wait, where the first group of guys are modeling ripped jeans and leathers, these ones are tailored in coats and expensive pants. Leather boys and coat go boys, I'll call them. Are, are there any fuck boys in there? <laughs> and just like the leather boys, coat boys also has something one that stands out. The guy in the middle has copper hair and dangerously dark eyes. As if every sin is trapped in his gaze. <laughs> like, okay, look, I know that this is romance and you're supposed to describe people as being, like, impossibly beautiful and shit, but... <laughs> every sin is trapped in his gaze <laughs> is probably my favorite stupid line I've read in a long time. Shit, Jesse breathes and pulls me to the side. We stand glued to the lockers like we're hoping to blend in. What's going on? I protest. Just keep quiet, Jesse hisses. Leather boys and coat boys meet at exactly where Jesse and I were standing just seconds ago. Rhodes, the leader from Leather Boys, snarls. Bowman, the leader from Coat Boys, snarls back. The tension can be cut with a knife. A butter knife, to be honest. Hell, even a spoon. Some of your guys were seen on my territory, Leather Leader says. Well, technically the whole town is my territory, Coat Leader shoots right back. Oh. My. God. This is Battle of the Egos. I have to refrain from asking Jesse to pass me the popcorn. This town belongs to us, Leather Leader says, and oh, there they go again, measuring levels of testosterone or something. The bell rings and everyone scurries to class, except for the bunch of guys blocking our way. I can feel Jesse tense up, not wanting to miss class, but also not wanting to interrupt these guys. We're going to be late, I say to Jessie, but she shushes me before I can get the entire sentence out. What the hell? It's my first day. I can't be late, I try again. When Jessie only responds by shushing me again and pressing me even harder into the locker, I just about have enough. Excuse me, Mr. Leather Jacket and Mr. Fancy Coat. Can you guys have an ego brawl some other time? We need to get to class, I interrupt. I hear Jessie suck in a breath and all eyes turn to me. Both silver and dark gazes send death glares. Well, shit. And, uh, that's the end of chapter one. So, that one... That one really wasn't that terrible. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna read more of it because it's not really something I'd be into, but... I mean... Like, there were some parts in there that were funny on purpose. Uh, the main character, Amber, did have some actual personality, even if it was kinda... tropey, I guess, is the word for it? I don't know, but... Yeah, yeah, there's worse stories out there, so uh, if that's something you're into, I guess you could check that out, but it it's just ungodly silly. That, that's, that's a good th way of putting it. It's ungodly silly, and there are a couple of parts which are just written really stupid. Stupid, but funny. This one is called Beach Trip by Red BXBE. BXBE? BXB? I don't know. Whatever. The Summary. Eight hormonal teenagers, one insane teacher, in a bus, going to the school's annual senior trip. Warning, contains mature language and content. Intro, which I guess is supposed to be like a prologue. Melody's POV. Hi, my name is Melody. I'm 17 years old. I live in California with my mother and my annoying older, only by five minutes, twin brother, Matt. I have two best friends named Lily and Cassidy. Cassidy is out of town, but she's coming the day of the trip. About me. I'm five foot five and have long wavy brown hair and brown eyes. So basically, tomorrow we are going on a senior trip. And I hope this goes well. <sighs> okay, where before I said that Amber's paragraph about her parents dying in a robbery was the, the worst exposition ever, that, that, that is the new worst exposition I've ever read. Chapter 1. Warning, a little steamy section in here. A uh, laughing emoji, heart with an arrow through it emoji. Melody's POV. I woke up to the sound of my alarm. Ugh, I groaned. I got out of bed and did my business and got out of shower. I wore a wine-colored crop top with the number 36 on bold white letters with a light washed high-waisted shorts, my high white converse, and a cream cardigan. I got my backpack and my phone. I went downstairs and my mom was cooking some pancakes. Not wasting time here. Good morning, mom, I said while kissing her cheek and sitting on a stool. Good morning, sweetie, she replied. Where's your brother? Probably upstairs sleeping his lazy ass, I answer. Hey, no I'm not. See, I'm right here, Matt says while stepping on the last step and winking at me. I roll my eyes at him. 
Okay, so browsing through a little bit, I'm realizing that around 90% of everything that happens here is just dialogue. So, and there's very rarely any uh, tags to it saying who's talking, and also at the same time, everyone talks the exact same, and there's conversations where like four or five people are talking together, so I have no fucking clue what's happening so far. Um, I think Lily is at school now, and she's talking to some of her friends. Are you going to the beach trip? I ask. I don't know. Are you going to the beach trip? He says, smirking. Hell yeah, I'm going, I say enthusiastically. Well, then I'm going, he says while kissing my cheek. I start to blush. I gotta go to English. See you on second period. See ya. I go to my assigned seat. I glanced over at the clock. Fifty-five minutes to go. I groaned. Good morning, class, says our teacher. Fifty-five minutes later. The bell rang, and I got up and went over to history. When I entered, Luke was signaling me to sit down next to him. I went over and settled down. You look extra hot today, he whispered in my ear. Thank you, you don't look so bad yourself, I whispered back. Okay, whatever other problems I have with this, this is how teenagers act when they're in a relationship. <laughs> that, that, that's an accurate depiction. All right, people, hurry up and get your notebooks out, Mr. Jones says as everyone got their notebooks out. Mr. Jones is our history teacher. He is a total insane person, but you can deal with him. Okay, so you are going to copy everything on these five boards, and I want it before the bell rings, he says while sitting on his desk. After he says that, an annoying boy starts to throw paper balls around the classroom for a while. Hey, get your shit together and clean the fucking floor, Mr. Jones yells at him. The boy starts to laugh at him. Oh, you think that's funny? Well, how about this, he says as he throws a little cushion at him. WTF, where did he get that from? The boy starts to clean the floor as everyone in class starts to laugh at him. Everyone shut the fuck up, Mr. Jones yells, and everyone stops laughing. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this teacher's an asshole. <laughs> like, gee, how is he not fired already? <laughs> is this a recent phenomenon that, that this... Okay. Okay, so there's a lot more stuff where she just sort of goes through the rest of her school day. She gets kind of steamy with her boyfriend. Uh, and then she goes home and starts packing, and now she starts texting her boyfriend. <clears throat> Luke. Uh, emoji with smiley face, heart eyes, heart. Hey babe, W-Y-D. Me, nothing, just watching Netflix. You? Luke. Nothing, just thinking about this girl named Melody. Winky face emoji. Me, stop flirting. Laugh emoji, smiley face with heart eyes emoji. Did you pack for tomorrow? Luke, yes, you? Me, well, duh, laughing emoji. Luke, whatever, go to sleep, baby girl. Sweet dreams, babe, I love you. Uh, kissy face emoji, heart emoji. My heart just melted. Me, okay, heart emoji. <clears throat> Way to go, Melody. I mentally slapped myself and turned off the TV and went to sleep. Yeah, yeah, definitely how teenagers act. Chapter 2, Melody's POV. At morning the day of the trip. I woke up and got out of bed. I showered quickly and dressed with a white and black Adidas hoodie, some black jeans, and my black... It, just, she just spends a lot of time describing her outfit there. I was doing my makeup until someone knocked my door. Come on, Mel, you need to hurry the fuck up or we're going to be late, Matt yells through my door. I'm coming, you dumb shit, I yell back. <laughs> Everyone in this story is just such an irredeemable asshole. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. Here's your breakfast, Mom says while handing us our plates. Thanks, Matt and I say at the same time while sitting down and starting to eat. After eating, we got our things and put them in the trunk of the car. At school. I'm gonna miss you, Mom says while hugging us. We're gonna miss you too, Ma, Matt and I say at the same time again. All right, we gotta go, Mom. See ya, Matt says while kissing her cheek. See ya, I say as I do the same as Matt. We got our things from the trunk and started walking towards all the buses. While I was standing there using my phone, someone caught my eye. It was Cassidy. Cassidy, over here, I yell and wave at her. I, I honestly forgot who Cassidy was already. Like, like I said, these characters all just blend together, and there's like 40 of them just crammed into this v not very long so far story. Oh my god, Cass, I missed you so much, Lily says, hugging Cassidy. I missed you more, girl, she replies. While they're talking, I see Luke coming over. Hi, babe, he says while pecking my lips. Luke, I told you, don't kiss me in front of everybody. There's just more kissing here. That's it. Everyone, come over here, Mr. Jones yells through the megaphone. Everyone gathers around him. I want everyone to go over Mrs. Owen so she can assign on what bus you are going, he yells again. Everyone starts going over there until Mr. Jones stopped us. Not so fast. You two are going on that bus with me, he says while pointing at a smaller bus. <laughs> Luke and I look at each other. Melody's on the short bus. Um, 
explains a couple of things. Uh, it explains a couple of things. Luke went over his friends while I went over to mine's. So, you and Luke, huh? Cassidy says while elbowing me. Shut up, and no, we're just friends, I say looking at him, and he looks at me back and winks at me. I start to blush. ooh -hoo, sure, she says sarcastically. Mr. Jones gets on the bus and tells the driver something. All right, everybody, listen up. This is a 24-hour drive. If you need to shit, well, you're bad, because we're not stoping the fucking bus, he yells, instructing. And also, if you eat something, make sure to clean it up, and if you don't do it, I'm going to personally shove it up your ass. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> he says the last part lower. Um, yes, I have one question. Can we sleep? Because I need my bo beauty sleep, Bella asks. This bitch. <laughs> yes, you can. But if we stop abruptly and you hit your head, it's not our responsibility, he says. Anyone else? He asks again. No one responds. All right, start the fucking bus, he yells at the driver. This is going to be a great trip. Okay, so several things. Um, one, she said she's in California, so why is it taking 24 hours to drive to the beach? Are they just driving to the opposite coast to, to, why would they do that? Um, okay. Secondly, if it's a 24-hour drive, you need to have a bathroom break somewhere in there, dude. And also, it, what? There, there's so much wrong with this. Just so much wrong with it. So I just browsed through some more of this, and it takes, like, four chapters for them to actually reach the beach. <clears throat> All of them start off with Melody's POV, which kind of implies that there will be other POV characters in this at some point, but I don't know who it could possibly be, and honestly, it's kind of funny to look at the spelling errors and everyone just being an obnoxious asshole to each other, but uh, it, I, I feel like you get the point after the first two chapters. So that one, again, I guess that is how teenagers actually act, so it's nice to be able to get that across. Um, other than that, I don't know if there's anything really positive to say about it. Uh, also, I'm not gonna lie, I went to that one just because I was looking for an excuse to play this clip, and I couldn't find one, but I'm gonna play it anyways. I see you don't have a lifeguard here at your beach. I'm not at the beach, this is a bathtub. Don't pretend you don't know where that's from. So this one might be my favorite, because this one's actually fan fiction. Pe people forget, I don't really read fan fiction very often, but it's out there, and some of, sometimes it, it can be so much worse than original fiction. Uh, so this one is called Female Creepypastas x Male Reader by Very Clapped. Summary. You are, your name, last name, an 18-year-old. Your sister was kidnapped and murdered. Your dad abused you before you lost your sister, but it only got worse after. He eventually skipped town, and your mom had overdosed on sleeping pills when she just couldn't take it anymore. You live alone and manage to get by. However, having no family meant you were an easy target and got picked on a lot. But one day after school, a single act led to a series of events that you definitely didn't see coming. Yep, I'm one of those people. I've read most of these fem CPs ex male reader things on here. I think that's females creepypastas ex male reader. Uh, so I thought I'd make an attempt at writing one that has, my attempt at, good grammar and makes an amount of sense in a fictional story. But yeah, heads up, if this is your first ex-reader book, stuff that's not clear when you read is explained below. Oh yeah, so ju just to be clear, uh, when it's this character ex-reader, that basically means that you, the reader, are forming a relationship with this character, so it's like told from your point of view. Uh, it, I don't know, it, it's never been my cup of tea. It seems weird to me, but I don't have a problem with the concept on its own. YN, your name. Ellen, last name. FC, favorite color slash favorite console. You'll know from context. SFC, second favorite color. I don't have a favorite color. Like, EC, eye color. HC, hair color. HL, hair length. SC, skin color. BN, bully name. G1, goon one. Number will change depending on number of goons and whatever one does or speaks something. FS, favorite song. FF, favorite food. I've definitely missed some, but I'll note, make a note of it when I realize. Also, I'm from Britain, so my spelling may be British? I'll do my best if that's understandable to everyone. Okay, so normally I would skip over the introduction stuff, because we already had that long introduction in the summary, and just start reading the chapter, but the intro to this one is just beautiful, and I kind of need to share it with you all. Your harem. 
Yeah, images and details, you're welcome. You can imagine their looks different if you want. I'm not your boss. I also add in cup size because what fun is a harem without a variety of boobs? I want you to remember that. He says variety of boobs there. Name, slender woman slash slenda. Age, question mark. Personality, kind, caring, motherly. Height, eight feet. Cup size, F. <laughs> Extra, she has facial features. I'll let you think of whatever. <laughs> because why bother describing what someone looks like? Uh, I would make fun of the F size breasts, but honestly, if you're eight feet tall, that's proportional. Name, Zalga, age, question mark, personality, relaxed, a little bit, evil, seductive, height, eight feet, cup size, triple D, extra, related to Slenda, their sisters. Okay, I might be talking out of my ass here, but isn't F and triple D the same thing? It, or, I, I don't know, I, I don't wear bras. Name, Jess the Killer, age, 20, personality, loud, slightly tsundere, aggressive, height, 5 foot 8, cup size, double D, extra, really likes weapons, especially blades. Name, Jane Arkansas, slash Jane the Killer, age, 19, personality, kind, respectful, fairly open, height, 5 foot 8, cup size, D, extra, hates Jess and they often fight. Name, Eyeless Jackie, slash Jackie. Age, 19. Personality, shy, quiet, self-conscious. Height, 5 foot 7. Cup size, D. <laughs> oh god, this one's horrifying. Name, Benny slash Benny Drowned. Age, 20. Personality, funny, lazy, pervy, flirty. Height, 5 foot 9. Cup size, double D. <laughs> Extra, her and Jill like to prank people. Somehow breaks the fourth wall. <laughs> Name, Laughing Jill, age 24, personality, childish, silly, flirty, height, 6 foot 5, cup size, double D. <laughs> Extra, if you can't tell from the image, she has a long nose. <laughs> Remember when he said variety of boobs? <laughs> so, there's like 20 of these, I don't think a single one is smaller than D. Because, yeah, I'm not gonna read all of these, like, there's double D, 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 double D, D, I, oh, hey, I found one with cup size C. Her name is Sally Williams slash Sally. <laughs> I just, I, I can't. This is, this is beautiful already, and I need, I need to get to the actual story now. Chapter 1. The New Girl, Sally Williams. Your name's POV. Uh, I guess whenever it says your name, I should just say James. So, James is POV. I woke up to the feeling of hunger and the sound of my al annoying alarm clock blaring next to me. I sighed, knowing I have to get up and ready for school, or as I call it, hell. It was never easy there, but after the incidents, it got much, much worse. At least it'll be harder to make fun of what I wear if it's all black, I thought as I began to get dressed. I put on black jeans, sneakers, and a t-shirt, then slid a hoodie over my shoulders. <laughs> After I was dressed, I made my way out of my room and went downstairs, but not before glancing at the other rooms and feeling my heart drop slightly. <laughs> After I got downstairs, I made myself some breakfast, brushed my teeth, fixed my hair, and grabbed my bag. I made my way to school. We can still make fun of you if you were in all black. I'm sorry. When arriving in front of the huge building, I took a deep breath to brace myself for today. This hellhole was full of surprises, and none of them were pleasant. I walked in and was constantly looking over my shoulder, worried about whatever this place would throw at me. I eventually made it to class. Luckily, I made it without any inconvenience. As I took my seat near the back of the room, the teacher walked in not too long after, with someone not too far behind her. Every guy in the room's jaw immediately dropped as soon as the new girl entered the door. She had long, light brown hair, emerald green eyes, and fair skin. She wore a pink hoodie, white ripped jeans, and some white sneakers. All right, class, we have a new student joining us for today, the teacher said, motioning for the... 4-4, four, four, the new girl, to say something. That was a very long paragraph. Hi, everyone, she said happily. My name is Sally Williams, and I look forward to working with you all. She finished by flashing an innocent smile. Well, that's nice. Please go take a seat at the back next to James, the teacher said, pointing towards the empty seat next to me. I felt every guy in the room glare at me. I just pulled my hood further over my head, hoping Sally wouldn't talk to me. I, I kind of feel like someone was spying on me when I was in high school and just wrote down what I did. <laughs> like, I'm really not even joking. That, that, that's kind of close to what I would do. Unfortunately, I was wrong. Not too long after she sat down, the teacher began to talk about the lesson. Sally attempted to start a conversation. Hey, your name's James, right? She asked. I simply nodded. I'm 
trying to listen to the teacher, bitch. That's a nice name, she said, in a friendly tone, one that I found very unfamiliar. Well, my name's Sally. It's a pleasure to meet you, she said, still trying her best to be kind. You said your name when you were up front, I said coldly, taking down some notes for the parts I didn't already know. Oh, oh yeah, she said, slightly embarrassed. But it's nice to meet you too, I said, feeling bad for embarrassing her. She simply giggled and began to take down notes of her own. There was a fairly minimal conversation for the rest of class, but once it ended, I knew I was in for hell. As I walked out of class, I was grabbed and slammed against some lockers, hard, and with quite a loud clanging noise coming from my collision. I looked at who grabbed me and I saw it was Bully Name and his goons. I should think of a name for the bully. We're, we're going to call the bully James 2, alright? I looked at who grabbed me and saw it was James 2 and his goons, the football team. Sup, nerd, was all James 2 said before throwing me away from the lockers into the floor. After sliding a bit, I looked back and saw them all walking over. I took the chance to curl up and cover my face in an attempt to feel as little pain as possible. I was stomped on, punched, and kicked multiple times. My decision to curl up ultimately didn't work as someone's foot connected with my stomach, making me uncurl and leaving myself open for the rest of their assault. Okay, you're in the middle of a school and no one's doing anything about this? Because this isn't even like a fight where just two guys are slapping each other around. This is like someone being savagely beaten by multiple other people. After they had seemed to have enough, James too kicked me once more, making me roll from my side onto my back. He then put one foot in my chest and stared me dead in the eyes. Don't go near Sally ever again, she's mine. If I see you near her again, you're dead, he said aggressively. I'm already dead inside, I muttered. I can't. I can't. There's, <laughs> There's too much edge here. Okay, like, if you looked at my Fiction Press account, you know that that's just 200% edge. This is 250% edge. <laughs> but, I can't. <laughs> I'm already dead inside, I muttered while getting up, only to receive his fist colliding with my jaw. As I was knocked to the floor once again, he kicked me once again. I didn't hear that, but I don't care. Shut up before I kill you, he said in a more serious tone before walking off with his goons close behind. The rest of the day was filled with me getting attacked, picked on, or just generally annoyed. But then again, this was just like most days. After all of my classes were over, I began to walk home, only to be tripped up and fall face first onto the sidewalk. Y you couldn't catch yourself? Okay. I heard some laughter, which was the, the followed up by a few kicks to my head and chest, but at this point I didn't really care, and I headed home. As I made it through the door, walked into my kitchen, with a sigh I opened one of the drawers to take out a large butcher's knife. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna read that next part, because he's actually just cutting himself at that point, and I don't want to make fun of self-harm, and I also don't want to seem like I'm glorifying it, because this one does genuinely feel like it's glorifying self-harm a little bit, so we're not gonna... We're, we're just gonna skip over that, okay? I watched Favorite Show until I felt like I was really tired. Oh man, do I even have a favorite show? I... I, I, I've been watching Arrested Development lately, so we'll say he's watching Arrested Development. I watched Arrested Development until I felt like I was really tired. Considering I already felt sort of weak from a fair amount of blood loss, I thought that I shouldn't fight the need for sleep. It was 11.54pm when I had drifted off to sleep, and for the first time in a while I might get at least 8 hours of rest. The rest of the week continued like Monday. Sally would more than likely have to sit next to me in class. I get beaten up, made fun of, and annoyed. I go home and hurt myself and eat. I sleep. Then it carries on. Every. Damn. Day. On Friday, I was eating lunch by myself as per usual, and I had my hood down. I felt like I should every once in a while. I, I felt like I should every once in a while. Okay. But then I heard footsteps walking in my direction. Look, I looked up, assuming it was James 2 coming for round 12, but I was wrong. It was... Sally. No, 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 I can't be seen with her, I thought as I began to panic. Hey, James, do you mind if I eat with you? Sally asked, smiling once again. Well, actua, I began to say before getting cut off. Wait, what happened? Sally pretty much yelled once she got a good look at my face. I had a black eye, some other bruises on my face, and the bandages had begun to cover my hands when I had run out of uncut space on my arms. Um... Okay, so James 2 already, like, beat the shit out of me in front of everybody with his gang. How does Sally not know about this by now? I feel like... This entire school already knows what's happening and they're just not doing anything about it for some reason? Nothing, I simply said. But how do you explain all of the damage? She asked, not yelling anymore, just concerned. 
Happens all the time, I said coldly while pulling my hood up and making an attempt to tuck my bandages away. What does that mean, Sally started before being interrupted by a loud voice behind her. What the fuck? The voice you recognized as James too yelled from behind Sally. What the fuck is the nerd doing talking to my girl, he yelled. This seemed to annoy Sally as she turned back around to yell back. For 80th time, James too, I'm not into you. I don't date assholes. But saying that only seemed to set him off. Aw, oh, come on, babe, you're not telling me that you'd rather date the school freak than the school hotshot, right? He said. Oh, well, I, I, I guess I'm a freak, but I'm also a hotshot, so that's cool. I'd choose him over you any day, Sally screamed, making me go slightly red under my hood. What? James too said in a tone of anger and confusion. I took this as a sign to start backing away, but then he began to sprint after me, making me run aw just as fast away from him. Sally began to run after us as well, trying to get James too to stop. Fortunately, enough school was ending earlier than normal today, allowing me to run out of the front door and head straight home. Luckily, I was fairly athletic, so I was able to outrun James too using my speed, high stamina, and my knowledge and ability when it comes to parkour. Weren't you saying that James too was on the football team, though? I mean, granted, you didn't specify what position he played. If he's a linebacker, I guess you could outrun him, but I, I, that, that feels weird. Okay, this next part might be my favorite just because of the images involved. I was really hungry after dropping my lunch in the hall, having to sprint home and not eating much for dinner this week. So I went to the fridge to get something to eat. I opened it inside. Looks like I'm off to the store, I thought to myself. I walked up to my room to grab my mask and my knife. And so he, here's the pictures here, his mask and his knife. I always brought this with me when I wasn't going to school. This town is unpredictable, but I still don't want people to know it's me if I have to do something. <laughs> because nothing helps you blend in better than wearing a skull mask over your face. <laughs> Trust me, kid, they, they know who you are, or who I am, I guess, because this is, this is me, after all. They, they know who I am. I'm the kid that dresses in all black and doesn't have any friends, and everyone feels kind of bad for me, but I'm also kind of an asshole. After putting my mask on and pulling my hood up, I put the switchblade into its hilt and put in in my pocket. I kept my hands in my pockets because it was comfortable, and that saves me the effort of having to reach in my jean pocket to grab it, and it minimalizes the chance I'll accidentally pull out my phone and I'll have to fumble to get my weapon. You spent a long time justifying that. I made my way out of the door and were headed towards the stores where the stores were. On my way there, I heard the scream of, a, of who I assumed was a girl coming from an alley next to me. I quickly got out of the alley's view and peered around the corner to see what was happening, and... It was Sally! She had screamed and was pinned against the wall. Upon further inspection, I saw who had her, held her there and with his hand now covering her mouth. It was James, too. The street was dead quiet, and I heard him say to her, There's no need to scream. I'll show you why I'm better than that freak you seem to like in an extremely creepy and perverted way. Long sentence. Knowing who he was talking about made me mad, but not as mad as I got when I saw his free hand drift down her face and hover over her breast. I was not going to let this happen. I felt my blood boil, and I moved faster than lightning towards James too. as I ran. I didn't have my knife out because I knew that if I did, I wouldn't hesitate to end him. As I was a few feet away from him, I raised my fist and used all my momentum to Superman punch him as hard as I could. He flew about nine feet before even hitting the ground to slide fully out of the alley and hit the car, denting it slightly. <laughs> I guess I'm a martial arts master now, um, which is cool, but... Why didn't I use that earlier? Like, these guys are constantly beating on me. Why do, it, all, You just have to hit him once. Like, if you hit him once and he goes flying down the hallway or something, they're going to leave you alone from then on. Unfortunately, he had two goons with him, and they had shown up at the end of the alley that I came through. Hey, James, too, I got some smokes and some booze. Holy shit! The first goon said only to panic when he saw me, a hooded figure to them. Sally perfectly safe, and James, too, at the other end of the alley against a car. You asshole, the second goon yelled, running at me, ready to punch. He was so sloppy, so I just slid backwards due to the fact that I had only turned my body halfway to look at them. As he missed and stumbled slightly, I saw the opportunity and sent my knee into his stomach at full force, following up with a leg sweep so he'd go down for a little longer. The first goon looked at me stunned, but pulled out what seemed to be a very large... Bayonet? Sure, whatever. Yeah, like, I am the ultimate martial arts master all of a sudden. I should have been using this... A long time ago, what the hell? Oh, we're switching POVs now. So this is now a uh, Goon 1 POV. And uh, Goon 1 doesn't have a name. I'm gonna call him Goon 2. 
and Goon 2 is going to be Goon 1, okay? So, Goon 2 POV. Holy shit, I thought as I saw James 2 slowly getting up from the slightly dented car and Goon 1 on the ground, struggling for breath. I was scared, but I pulled out my knife to hopefully spook him so I didn't have to fuck with him. <laughs> There's another picture of another knife. I held it backwards, sort of, the way the military guys do in movies, just so I looked like I knew what I was doing, and I charged at the guy. And now we're back to James POV. It was really necessary to have that brief moment there. The guy held his, what I now saw was actually a buoy rather than a bayonet, knife in a reverse grip. I smiled a little bit under my mask. <laughs> that grip makes sense for stabbing, but slashing would make more sense here. Bad move, man, bad move. <laughs> He charged me with his knife held high, and he brought it down towards me once he got close. Too close. He was about a foot from me when he brought his knife down, so I ducked down and leaned forward and clutched his throat. Raising him up with ease, I then slammed him down. Hard. I heard a slight crack, but I knew I didn't break anything. I would have made it more painful if that's what I wanted. I chuckled as he yelled in pain, and I stole his knife and the sheath it was originally kept in. I was about to walk away, but then I heard some heavy footsteps charging my direction. I turned to see James too charging with a butterfly knife, but I could see it wasn't locked open, so I just moved and tripped him. He slipped and the knife closed when he hit the ground and let go of it. It had left a large gash across his arm due to how he dropped it. While he was clutching his arm screaming like his friend was, I also took his knife and grabbed Sally's hand and walked out of the alleyway with her in tow. But not before I turned back to give a final kick to the still conscious James too and say in an almost demonic voice, Don't keep fucking with people, you'll end up dead next time. Uh, I know that's not a very good demonic voice, but this is me doing this, remember, so if I were to attempt a demonic voice, that's really the best I could do. As I turned back to Sally, she flinched in fear of me attacking her with a new knife in my hand. I simply chuckled a little and put the already closed blade into my pocket. She looked confused. Who are you? she asked, trembling slightly. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell. The mask, that you, you really can't see anything. All I did was take my hood down so she could see my hair and the part of my face that wasn't covered by my mask. This didn't seem to help her, so I rolled up my sleeves to show my bandages. Something clicked, and she gasped and began to say something, but I simply put a finger to my lips so she wouldn't say anything that could be overheard. And then I told her to head home and offered to escort her, but she said it wasn't too far, and the I didn't need to worry. I trusted that she knew what she was doing, if she was just that confident in going alone after what had happened. Then I headed back for the store. Okay, so that one, um... Like I said, 250% pure edge. There's just nothing else there. And you know what? If, uh, if that's what you're into, that's what you're into. It's just pure wish fulfillment. It's not really deep or anything, but it's also not trying to be. And I guess, other than the fact that there were huge paragraphs that went on forever and he really long run-on sentences that went on forever, the grammar itself was okay. Um, and... You know, I, I guess I really can't be too hard on something that is very clearly just wish fulfillment. Like, it's stupid and a little cringy to me, or extremely cringy to me, but it's also just a lot of fun. It's really funny. Okay, so this next one isn't really a story so much as a uh, section on the website. Because, uh, you know, you can divide it up based on genre. Like, there's action, fantasy, LGBT, romance, that sort of stuff. Uh, there's one near the bottom that it took me a while to even notice. It's just called Urban. And when they say urban, they mean stories about black people. Which seems kinda racist, but let's see what they have to offer. The first one on there is just called The Plug's Son by Deschanel underscore XO. Uh, the summary just says, Camilla, high school student, work at part-time job. Cameron, 20, Plug's Son, doesn't need a job. Rich as fuck. That's all it says. I, I don't know what a plug is. Hold on a sec. Okay, Google. Plugs, son. No, not slugs, son. Okay, Google. What is a plug? Informal. Mention a pro... Yeah, I honestly don't know what a plug is, or so I don't know what a plug son is, so uh, we're just gonna move on. The next one is Easy Enough by Imi Mani. Summary. A strung-out mother, selfish aunt, hoish sister, and nowhere to turn are only the, a few of the problems that Devin has to deal with. She just wants to finish school and leave everything behind, but that same everything is determined to keep her exactly where she is. Trying to find a way out of seemingly no way, Devin Giannis is faced with the harsh realities of the real world on her own. Then she meets Ace, the biggest drug dealer in the whole city. 
She finds it almost impossible to steer clear of him. Will he change her life for the better, or will he only complicate her already complicated life? With a Twist by Authentic Black Gold. Your typical story. With a Twist. I... I don't know what that means. East 99th Street by I Might Be D. East 99 is where you'll find us slangin' that yayo. Cleveland is the city where we come from, so run run. Okay, so remember how I said that having all the stories about black people in a genre referred to as urban seemed kinda racist? Uh, most of these stories deal with living in the ghetto, drug dealers, teenage pregnancy, and, um, you know, that's not really doing much to dispel the notion that it is racist. Okay, so we've mostly been focusing on the romance stuff so far. Let's go into some other genres, because, you know, there's plenty of terrible fantasy and science fiction out there. So here's a fantasy one called Axiom by Daniel Leonhardt. Summary. Cassera Rihanna... Cassera Rihanna Axiom is the most powerful mage ever born and the granddaughter to the most influential man in the world. But her misuse of her powers and blatant disregard of other nations' borders has the delicate political balance on edge. As a result, her mother informs her that on her 18th birthday, she will be banished to Thaxium, where she will have to forge her own path in life. On top of this, because of how dangerous Thaxium is, her family wants her to get married before she is ban ban banished. Now she only has one week to sort things out. Okay, so that one doesn't sound too awful on the surface, actually, um, other than the fact that the summary immediately had three weird words in at the beginning of it, um, it doesn't automatically sound like it'll be terrible. Just wait. Prologue. Mathis Nylander Axiom Jr. walked through his ancient oak doorway into Headmaster Alton's office. The Headmaster stood at the opposite end of the room, gazing out the window, stroking his long white beard. Having a... Have a seat, Mathias, he said, waving to the chair in front of his desk. Mathias... Mathis... I can't read these names, I'm sorry. Mathis made his way over and hopped up on the wooden chair, worn smooth, worn smooth over the centuries of other students just like him. Or maybe not just like him. In fact, no other student in the world was anything like him. Alton turned around, strolled over, and picked up Mathis' file. You have completed all the courses the school has to offer, and as such, you will be receiving your diploma with the highest honors this afternoon. Thanks, exposition man. Mathis felt that butt hanging in the air and raised his eyebrow at the wizened old man. Ah, yes, you are very perceptive for someone of your... age. In fact, your age is the very reason we are having this conversation. It is common for children of your stature to make mistakes because they lack the wisdom that comes with life and time. In most cases, a child of eleven such as yourself is not capable of doing any serious harm. However, this is not the case in your situation. If you were to make even one of the aberrations that are common among your peers, it could very well change the face of our planet. Mathis closed his eyes. The headmaster was dancing around the point with his words. Okay, so that's going on. That goes on for a little bit. Basically, the headmaster is just saying that Mathis is. He's only 11 years old, but he's already like this most super powerful, amazing magic user ever. And so he has to keep him uh, as a teacher at this school to prevent him from getting into trouble, basically. And Mathis is pretty aware of the fact that he's imprisoned. Like, you, you can wrap it in pretty language, he's just imprisoned. It had been months since that conversation with the headmaster, and this was the first time since that I had been allowed off campus. Oh, so now we're switching to first person. I walked through row after row of perfectly trimmed assorted fruit trees with my students following closely behind me. This was the start of their senior year, and it was my job on this field trip to teach them the supposed intricacies of weaving an automatic harvest spell, a spell I had learned how to cast when I was five years old. It would be a miracle if the morons that my students consisted of could properly cast the spell without cutting their own arms off. I swear for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how half of them had passed their previous year. I knew for a fact the most popular one of them could barely read, much less actually properly craft a spell. So, imagine for a moment that you're a senior in high school. You're like 17, 18, 19 years old, and you're being taught by an 11-year-old. Just... Just imagine that for a minute. Wow, that sounds awful. So he goes through teaching them some stuff, uh, and then this happens. A rift less, rift less than ten feet away from me opened up. A woman with long flowing black hair clad in black leather stepped out onto the water. A smile spread across her high cheeks, high cheek boned face as her, wow, that's a terrible sentence, as her eyes lit on me. 
Mathis, son of Mathis Nylander and grandson of Archland the Devourer Slayer, I presume. Thanks, exposition woman. It's a great pleasure to finally meet you, and I must say it's about time they let you out of their little cage. I would bowed slightly. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage, Mrs... Tara, and I'm not married yet. Okay, Miss Tara, may I ask why you interrupt my class? Okay, even for a genius, this kid talks weird. Oh, listen to the little brat talk all posh, one of the boys standing at the stream's edge jeered. Tara rolled her eyes at the juvenile statement and looked down at me. I have an offer for you. What type of offer? One I dearly hope you accept. That depends on what it is. I will free you from your bonds of injustice, and in return, you shall become my spouse and help me carve out my own kingdom in the Badlands. Once you've reached of age, I will bear your child, and as a family, we shall make our new kingdom one to rival the eight. She is an anarchist, one of the girls in my class gasped. Okay, no. No. No, that's not how anarchists that's not how anarchists work. This is appropriation of my culture and I won't stand for it. What, who, who wrote this again? What, just yeah, I I don't want to look up the name right now. Just no. No. None of that. Torik, the popular boy of the senior year, raised his hand. Well, I say we take her down then. A ball of fire blossomed into existence in front of him. Tara didn't even bother to look at him as she raised her palm, forming a barely perceptible shield around herself. What do you say? At that very moment, one of the auto-harvest spells carrying fruit collided with Torek's fireball, and it blew up in his face, sending him head over heels into one of the trees. Yeah, so he, he tries fighting Tara, and she kicks his ass. And then, I'm sorry, Miss Tara, it's a delightful offer, really, but I've got a student to heal, I said to the lady and started to trudge towards the fallen child when one of the four girls screamed hysterically, How dare she hurt Torek? How dare she hurt that? How dare that witch hurt Torek? Before I could stop her, she tore off the locket around her neck and threw it at Tara with all her might. The locket was enchanted with a simple self-defense spell designed to cause the attacker's spell to implode on itself when thrown, and wouldn't have done a single thing to Tara because she wasn't forming or charging a spell, but as it flew out over the water, it collided with the main spell governing the streams. The world screamed, and the stream beneath my feet erupted violently, spewing fruit and water hundreds of feet in all directions. Th that seems weird, but okay, whatever. Tara floated lightly into the air. Are you sure you don't wish to accept my offer? You know Alton will never let you go, especially after this. Her words rang true. This was just the type of mistake he had been talking about before. No matter how to, I try to explain this, this was going to be my fault. The headmaster would do everything in his power to make sure I never left the campus again. She was right if I stayed the rest of my life would already be decided for me. All my genius and power would go to waste teaching teenagers that would never respect me, especially made all the worse by the fact that I was not allowed to discipline them in any decent way. Tara must have been able to see what I was thinking, though, through the look on my face, because she said, If you bond with me, the headmaster's seal will be instantly broken, and you will be free. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Fine, but if you ever cheat me or cheat on me, I will level the full power of the Axiom bloodline against you. She raised an eyebrow. Cheat on you? Yes, I may be too young right now to enjoy your womanliness, but when I do come of age, I want my wife to be whole and unspoiled. <laughs> what kind of fucking 11-year-old talks like this? Fair enough, she held out her hand. I reached out to take it, but at the last second I pulled back. Wait, I must warn you, a bond with me will be far more potent than normal. She lowered her own hand. Just how more potent are we talking? We will share memories and even thoughts. She stared blankly at me until one of the students shouted. The witch is still here. She's attacking our teacher. I agreed to the offered bond and the world faded away as our magics reached for each other. My small body burned with exhilaration as I felt both hers and my magic race up our arms and entangle like long-lost lovers. Van, her magic, entered through my fingertips and flowed down my palm into my... Okay, um, it's written kind of weird here, but basically all that stuff that we were viewing was actually uh, the main character viewing it through a memory. She's like wearing a memory circlet and so, yeah, I have no idea how to pronounce her name. It's Xrenya? Xrenya? I don't know, this. Zrenya ripped the memory circuit off and dropped it to the floor. Wait, Mom, you not telling me this is how Grandma married Grandpa, are you? A smile spread across Xrenya's mother's face. Yes, dear, that's exactly what this is, she said as she picked up the circlet. You can't be serious. He bonded with her just like that? Yes, dear, that is exactly how it happened. And I married your father in much the same manner. Zrenya stared at her mom in confusion. Why are you showing me this n- Ow! Grandfather has finally found someone he wants me to marry, hasn't he? Who is he, and what's his name? The smile on her mother's face faded as she strode over to the couch by the terrace and sat down. Come sit with me, sweetie. 
Extremia's side. She knew this day would always come eventually. Her grandfather always said he was going to arrange her marriage, no matter how adamantly her father told her she wouldn't let him. She knew his, her father would have the final say. She moseyed on over to her mother and plopped down. Truth be told, she didn't expect it to be all that bad. Her father was the greatest man to ever live, and her grandfather the second. Both of them loved her like she was their prized jewel. If they had finally agreed on a man, he must be one fine specimen of a human being. Her mother put her arm around here. Sweetie, it pains me to tell you this, but on your 18th birthday, you're going to be officially disowned and banished to the continent of Thaxium, where you'll need to start your own kingdom. Wow, n not pulling any punches there, Mom. Extremia pulled away and shot to her feet. What? Why? Her mother turned away. Because with you becoming of age, the, the combined magical power of our family rank rivals that of any army, and thanks to your little show last week, all of the eight other nations are on edge. All I did is kill two giants, she protested. Yes, and you left a crater the size of one of the Great Lakes, destroying acres of usable land. Yeah, but no one was using it. Those two giants had seen to that, her mother sighed. And your complete and dis blatant disregard for national boundaries hasn't helped anything either. either. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's like two-thirds done with the first chapter, and I, I just can't do any more. It's, it's, it's too bad. It's too much. So... That one is bad partially because it just started off with a gigantic exposition dump, which really wasn't necessary because it's not even about the main character. But, like, the main character is just hearing about her grandfather, and honestly, like, that uh, conversation with her mom could have been an okay beginning on its own, but the fact that you had to wade through all that other shit to get to it is annoying. Not to mention that it switched between third and first person twice, uh, all the shitty grammar, just, yeah, I, I can't do it. Uh, however, despite the fact that her grandfather, Xrenya, whatever, that's also a stupid name, but uh, Xrenya's grandfather is some sort of super genius, he's also portrayed as being kind of an asshole. Uh, and from the little I read, Xrenya also appeared to be just an asshole, and she was portrayed as that. So, I do kind of like that, because... I mean, assuming the author is aware of the fact that the main character is a terrible person, that gives them room to grow and room to develop. Whereas if they're treating them as like, oh, this is the coolest, most awesome, best guy ever, then there's really nowhere for them to go with that, and they're just going to be an obnoxious character. And so, real quick, rather than talking about another regular story, I want to talk about a genre that I found on there, and it's just weirdly prominent. So, you might remember that around six months ago, I read through a story called Muslima Next Door, and it was just about this Muslim girl who lived in America who met a white dude and fell in love, and it was hilariously awful. Uh, just, seriously, just watch my video on that. I'll put a link ooh, somewhere. I don't, I don't know how those eye cards work, but whatever. It, it's going to be there, and it's just hilariously awful. But since then, in my recommendations, I've been getting other Muslim love stories, which are all pretty much the exact same thing. Like, there's some variation, but there are so many of these stories which involve a Muslim girl living usually in America, but sometimes in the United Kingdom or another Western country, who falls in love with a white dude, and I don't know why there's so many of them. There's Muslima Next Door, which I already mentioned. There's also an American Muslima falling in love with the Muslim girl, the hijabi and the jock, not your expected hijabi, hijabi and the playboy, and j Why are there so many of these? I don't... Like, I don't have a issue with it, I just am very confused. Like, it's the same thing. I, I just, if, if anyone has any ideas as to, like, what is happening in society to make that such a common thing to show up on this website, and relatively popular in some cases, just let me know, because I'm, I'm just confused. Again, no problems with it, just I don't know what's happening. And so, to end this off, in the name of fairness, I think I should point out a couple of actually decent stories that I found on Wattpad, because not all of them are terrible. Like, a lot of them are just meh, honestly, which is fine, because, you know, it's beginner writers for the most part, but some, sometimes you will find a little gem uh, buried in the dirt. So, uh, I just want to point uh, you in, a cup, in the direction of a couple of those, and you can check them out if, you, if they sound interesting. So, the first one is The Witch and the Dragon by... Lemedlock, or Lemedlock, something, something like that. And that one is just about a woman who uh, gets kidnapped, basically, and forced to become a sacrifice for a dragon, uh, but then she doesn't get eaten, and she 
has to make her way home, and I've only read part of it, so it might be terrible later on, but honestly, the first uh, couple of chapters are pretty good, and, you know, the main character has actual personality. She actually uh, has agency, and even though she's kind of in a shitty situation, she doesn't let it get to her that much. It, it, it's a neat story, and I, I will be reading the rest of it at some point. This next one is called Runner by I'm Hannah Hunt, and... Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Hannah Hunt. It, it, whatever. Uh, anyways, and this one is actually complete, so I want to get around to reading it all the way through at some point. But basically, it's uh, there was a global pandemic. It's it's just zombies. It You can change the name. You can change a little bit about them. They're just zombies. So this one is just about a teenage girl who lives after the zombie apocalypse and runs out and gets supplies and tries to help people. And, like, I, I don't need to tell you that much else about it. It's... It's kind of the same story we've all read a bunch of times, but this one is actually done pretty competently well so far, so I want to point you in that direction. Plus, it's completed, so you don't really have to worry about the author never finishing it, which happens with a lot of these. And I know I just brought this up a minute ago, but honestly, it's actually a pretty good one. It's uh, Hijabi and the Jock, and this one is basically just Muslima Next Door if it was actually done well. And I will say it's not finished yet, but I kind of hope the author finishes it at one point, because I've read all the way through it so far, and I'm interested in seeing where it goes. But yeah, it's just Muslim Next Door if it was done well. It's a Muslim girl who lives in America, and she meets a white dude, and they start forming a relationship. But the difference is, one, there's actual build-up to their relationship. Uh, they're actually both, like, you can feel them being friends, even though there's tension there. You can feel that they become friends pretty quickly, pretty early on. Uh, and you can feel something else is starting to build there, and there is some actual difficulty because of just cultural differences, but you can tell they still really like each other, and I'm honestly interested in seeing where that goes. It's it, it's just a cute story is the thing. Like, it's not amazing. It's not super deep, and it, it does have some stupid points in it, don't get me wrong. I, I originally considered reading through it and just laughing at some of the issues, but no, nah, nah, it's... Overall, it's a decent story, it's a cute story, and if that's what you're into, then go check it out. So, that took a long time. Uh, I don't know how long this is going to be when I'm finished editing it, but it'll probably be over an hour long. And uh, so I just want to end off by saying that if you wrote something like this that was really cringy when you were younger, or even recently, uh, or if, hell, if you were one of the people whose stories I just made fun of a little bit, uh, don't be discouraged, okay? I, I really mean that. Just don't be discouraged. I want you to look at this and say, you know what? Th that was bad, but I'm going to practice some more, and it'll be less bad. Because people like Stephen King, like Brandon Sanderson, like George R. R. Martin, they weren't amazing when they started, okay? They, they were shit, just like all of us, and then they sanded off the edges and kept practicing, and eventually they were less shit, okay? Like, if you look at my Fiction Press account, which... Please don't. <laughs> Again, please don't. It's, it's awful, but if you look at that and look at the early stuff versus the later stuff that I posted, which later stuff being 2015, but anyways, uh, if you look at that, you can still see a pretty substantial difference between my writing style. And so what I'm saying there is that you do get better over time. So what I want you to do, if uh, you feel bad about some stuff you wrote, I want you to get better, I want you to practice, and I want you to come back with something amazing and shove it in my fucking face, and shove it in the face of everybody who said you were awful, uh, because, hey, you actually put yourself out there. And especially if you actually completed one of these, because if you completed a novel-length work, that is farther than just about anyone ever gets, and you should be proud of that. No one can take that away from you. want to give a shout-out to Des Brennan and all my other patrons. I really, really appreciate you guys, because videos like this take a longer time to make, and... I don't think I'd be able to do it without your support, so I, I really love you, I appreciate you. And if you aren't a member of my Patreon, Patreon, then check out my page and see what kind of stuff you can get. Like, you know, early access, polls, there, there's some neat stuff there. So I will see you guys later. Bye!